Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cyber Distortion Podcast. We bring on special guest Philip Wiley, who loves to take you behind the curtain of professional hacking. He's the king of compelling discussions with all kinds of guests with diverse backgrounds. He's normally the host of the Philip Wiley Show, but tonight he's right here with us to talk shop and have some fun. Please put your hands together for our good friend, Mr. Philip Wiley. Episode 2, Unbearably Dedicated with Philip Wiley. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 2 of the Cyber Distortion Podcast. Kevin and I are back again. We're off to a hot start. If you haven't seen the Deep Fake Episode 1 that we just dropped, Man, you want to spend some time going through that one. You're going to learn a lot from that one. It was a lot of fun doing that. But tonight, tonight, we're going a different direction. We're going to bring on, and we like to do this periodically, but we like to bring on other content creators that we work with. And tonight, we have a fascinating content creator that we want to bring on and talk to you guys all about and get you guys to know more about if you don't know him already. And this content creator is Philip Wiley. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Philip Wiley. This guy is a good friend of ours. He's a partner of ours in the Cyber Circus Network. And over this last year, we have collaborated on several different things, and we really enjoy our, our Philip time. Right, Kevin? <laughs> Man, do we ever. <laughs> do we ever. So much so that we started a network with him, but we'll get into that in a second. Yeah, yeah. We'll get into that. But so, Philip, you know, this guy. It almost seems like every time I talk to him, he is doing something, right? Busy man. Nonstop busy. Man. busy. Hey, I thought I was busy, but this guy's always busy, right? And and so just let me give you a little bit of the accolades of, of where he's been and what he's been doing. So Philip Wiley is a penetration tester, an instructor, keynote and international speaker, best-selling author, host of the Hacker Factory, and the Philip Wiley podcast show. He's a content creator and the DEF CON Group 940 founder. And that's just a little bit of it, right? Every time I hear, I, we have a conversation, Philip's like, yep, I've got another one scheduled. He's got another conference he's speaking at somewhere in the world. <laughs> this isn't just like around the corner in another state. This is like, this guy goes everywhere and speaks. People are asking him to speak often. So if if that doesn't get you excited to hear from this guy, this professional in cybersecurity, I don't know what will, but we're going to dive into it. Kevin, what do you think about our guest? I think our guest is awesome, man. I, I, I remember when I first uh, started following Philip a little bit, and that was through the DC 940 DEF CON meetup group that Philip founded. And uh, I remember I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go out here and check this out. I had never gone to a DEF CON meetup. And uh, went out there that night, and I remember getting there, and Philip was out, of course, traveling <laughs> the week I went out there for my first meeting, and he wasn't there. And I'm like, dang it. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna try again next month. And uh, finally, uh, w we met up, and I remember, Philip, I remember you you took the time after your, because you were presenting that night, too, at, at the DC meetup. And uh, in fact, you were presenting on content creation that night. Uh, so it was it was a very interesting topic for me to sit and listen in on because you know we're doing that as for fun on the side and i remember thinking oh man i, I really want to talk to philip after the show and kind of you know get to know him and start networking with him and see what he's all about but i didn't really want to bother you either because i know you're so busy I, to me it was almost like is this dude unapproachable or is he going to be really cool <laughs> so I remember after your presentation, I walked up, introduced myself, and and dude, we we talked forty five minutes. Nicest guy on earth, really down to earth, awesome, awesome, awesome dude. And uh, from there, it's just kind of our friendship's kind of grown. 
And I remember, Philip, you, I told you that night we were going to Def, uh, we were going to Black Hat and DEF CON because it was only about two, a couple weeks away at that point. And you said, yeah, let's meet up out there and, and maybe uh, network a little bit while we're there. And you had invited us to go see our, our other buddy, Chris, at Barcode. And it, we ended up going. And I think somebody drug you away that night to another event. So you didn't even end up getting to go. It's, talk about getting over, but look, this dude's probably got 15 people pulling in 15 <laughs> different directions. Anyway, that's how we, that's how this whole Cyber Circus Network got started. And uh, Philip, I got to thank you for that. Getting to know you and Chris has been awesome. So thank you and welcome to the show, sir. It's an honor. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be joining you guys to finally get on here. Uh, but it's really cool to get to get to meet and know you guys too. So we had a lot of fun when we did the the live podcast event in Grapevine. So I think it's really awesome to be doing the collaboration. I look more forward to more more live events, and I hope that we do something during Black Hat and DefCon. That should be a blast. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Philip, one thing that um, has been a consistent message that I've heard prior to meeting you and after meeting you, if I continue to hear this, no matter who I speak with, is Philip's just a great guy. I hear that often, yeah. you know, and, and it is, it's been, it's been true from my experience. I've been just, you know, just happy that we got to meet and, you know, be able to do things together. It's fun to have a community of people that, that, you know, are looking out for all of our interest that you can collaborate with and socialize with and have laughs with you know we've had several laughs <laughs> already you know yeah. so so i really enjoy that but let's get the audience to know you a little better tell us a little bit about the backstory of philip wiley sure how far you want me to go do you want me to go back <laughs> how far do we <laughs> go to all the we need to go because i i know one thing we need to do and that's the elephant in the room yes <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that we maybe we don't want to go back that far, so that way we don't kind of ruin it. We that way whenever we get to that part, part of okay. the show, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I agree. So I kind of guess I'll share my technical background. So really, what got me into originally was I was looking for a job. I'd graduated high school, didn't know what I was going to do for a living. Got married, and I needed a job with benefits. So one day I was at home watching daytime television because back then a lot of the jobs I worked were night jobs in restaurants or retail and and i was watching television one day and i always liked to draw when i was younger and i saw an advertisement for ati the american trade institute for their cad drafting program so i decided to go sign up for that and learn autocad and so i got into the autocad you know into the cad industry one of the things i like to share especially to help motivate others was when i was going through school this was in 93s i guess when i started 93 finished like in 94 before that i my only exposure to computers was playing playing video games on prodigy <laughs> and that was my extent i really didn't know how to use a computer that well i got into the class i was in i was probably the worst on computers but the thing was that's kind of uh nice about it is once i got through school i got out in the workforce when that kind of changed i went from being like one of the worst with computers to one of the best on the team wherever i worked and so i was always better about figuring out new features in the latest versions of AutoCAD that would come out, the different releases, I'd figure out how to, to, to use those different functions. And also Windows 95 was new while I was uh, early in my CAD, <laughs> CAD days. And so I was able to figure out how to do printing on Novell Networks through uh, Windows 95 when our on-site uh, IT person couldn't figure <laughs> that out. And it's funny, kind of funny, the first time I ever got called a hacker, was by this this guy. Actually, he was in accounting, but he was on site that him do all the IT functions. And so I was called a hacker because I was figuring out how to make the computer work properly and all this. He was kind of jealous that I figured it out and just... He was so, afraid you're going to steal his uh, job. During huh? that time, yeah, I guess so. Make him look bad or whatever. He was the expert and someone else was able to do things he couldn't. So I taught myself how to build computers and then also took a Nobel Netware certification course and got my first sysadmin role. Mm. So I was in CAD drafting probably about three or four years. And then I saw mm -hmm. that CAD drafters were making, I mean, that sysadmins made more money because I worked at this one company. They had a sysadmin come in. They were charging $50 an hour to work on the server. This was in 95. And so I saw that they were making 
they're getting $50 an hour. And I knew based on our rate as drafters, we were making like $15 an hour. They were billing us out at $30 an hour. So I thought this guy's making like $10 an hour more than me. And what he does looks a lot more fun. So I taught myself how to build computers, took the Nobel Netware certification course and got my first job on a Netware in Windows 95 rollout and spent six years as a sysadmin, found out about cybersecurity. Back then, I guess they were called info security or, or data security. Got interested in that. I got my CISSP. The company had an opening, so I moved over to that team. So I was doing network security first, managing firewalls and intrusion detection systems, doing some vulnerability scans and some risk assessments. And then the company hired a new CISO. When he came in, he had a more modern idea of the way security groups should be set up. All of us on the team, there were like five or six of us. We all did the same thing. So when he came in, he divided us up into different sections. And fortunately, I got put into AppSec. Mm -hmm. And so AppSec is where I found out about pen testing because I managed our third-party pen test. We didn't do the pen test ourselves. We'd use consulting companies. I did some vulnerability scanning. And I'd also work with remediation of the vulnerabilities found during the pen test. So I found out about that and got interested in it, took some courses on ethical hacking, took a CEH course and one of the Foundstone Ultimate Hacking courses. So if you remember Foundstone, they were some of the same folks that wrote the Hacking Exposed oh, yeah. books. Yeah. And and so kind of got interested in it. Then when I got laid off in 2012, I applied for a pen testing role with Verizon in their consulting division and fortunately got the job. And so that's kind of where I started. Spent five years in consulting, then worked as an internal resource for companies. I've done some teaching. I used to teach at Dallas College. I taught pen testing and web app pen testing. And that's really kind of a pivotal year because I was always sharing resources with people, but not at the scale now. So I started teaching and I just kind of t changed my whole focus. My focus before was just being the best I could be and focused on that. And then I th and one of the things I was thinking is, you know, as I was getting older, it's kind of hard. I was never one of the best pen testers or hackers, just to state that for the record. But I was always trying to be my best or whatever, mm -hmm. kind of competitive and just really push myself. And then I finally decided when I started teaching at Dallas College, I thought, you know, the world needs teachers, mentors, uh, and coaches. And I'm a lot better in those areas than I am, you know, with the pen testing thing. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll put put my effort in that. So that's where I really put my focus into helping others. And, and it's been a real blessing. I feel like I never did it for anything in return except to help people. But then I got all these opportunities yeah. from it. Better paying jobs. I started building my brand. I started getting more opportunities. And uh, and also from teaching at the college, I wrote a book called The Pen Tester Blueprint, which is based on the lecture I gave my first day of class at Dallas College. And so by I gave that first time in January 2018. By November 2018, I gave it as a, as a conference talk at our B-Sides DFW conference. And an interesting story about that for like in the Dallas community is there's a lot of people in that session learning how to be pen testers for my pen tester blueprint talk that are now pen testers. One of them was Juno that oh, was yeah. on our, in our event. So that was my, when she saw that, decided she wanted to be a pen tester, signed up for my class. And so now she's been pen testing for, for several years. And there were other folks in that audience that watched that, that have become pen testers. So just to be able to help people and inspire others to get into pen testing has been a load of fun. And, and like I said, I really wasn't looking for these blessings or, or benefits from doing this, but it's just, it, you know, it's just like you do, you know, good things and good things happen. And it's, it's been great. It's, it's really surprised me. Some of the opportunities. There's two things that stood out to me when you were telling that story, Philip. One, the first one is when you were saying things like Windows 95 and Novell <laughs> Networks, boy, that was really get, pushing me back in the day, yeah. man. And back in the day, w people like that, people like us were considered hackers because we were always doing hacks. We were always trying to make yeah. this stuff work, right? And we were, we were exploring new ways to do this stuff better. And this, te this technology hadn't been fully flushed out yet, right? So we were always coming up with, with new ideas or ways that were undocumented, not intended to work that way. And we're like, yeah. yep, well, it works. And it works better than the way they had it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that was exciting. It reminded me of that. But the second thing is, <laughs> is that that story is a true success story from figuring out you want to do something, focusing your attention on it you know, over the years, really just 
pegging away at it and pegging away at it until you started to achieve something and you know you've you've achieved it when the results are that give back effect like you were talking about from your book when people are starting to learn from the work that you've achieved through that cycle that's how you know that's one of the ways you know that that's a true success and and so it's fun to hear that story because I, that's what that's why we do what we're doing right now. I mean, that's the reason mm -hmm. why we're doing this podcast is so that people can, as a part of this give back, people can learn and maybe take away something from it. And you know what? Maybe this podcast, this episode will sp spark some excitement for a few people to say, hey, I think I want to go do that now and start working on their career in cybersecurity. Yeah, it, it's a good feeling uh, when you when you do that. And, and I found one of the best motivators in the world is passion. And when you're passionate about something, you can do anything as long as you're passionate. Yes. It does not matter what your skill set is when you first enter into that realm. If you're passionate about it, you can figure it out. And it, it's interesting that you started out, uh, the way you started out is kind of similar to my path. But when you said you took the CEH and you enjoyed the pen testing, um, I was kind of there too. The, the challenge I had in my position was I got the CEH to pen testing class and I thought, man, this is really cool. I would love to do this all day long, every day. This is cool stuff. And there's just something about hacking and, and being in that world and, and successfully popping a shell, popping your first, I remember popping my first shell in my Linux, Cali Linux box. I'm yeah. like, holy <laughs> shit, success, man. That was so sweet. And I, I remember yeah. thinking, Thing, but there's only one problem. How, how's my company going to appreciate that I can do that? You know, and uh, ultimately, I had to re reality had to slap me back in into the corporate world, and I realized, okay, I can't really do this for a living, but I can oversee all of our <laughs> pen testing efforts. And you know, you mentioned you kind of got into that overseeing pen test efforts and the remediation uh, as a result of it. So, kind of a cool, similar background. Um. But I, I like that, that you have that passion to help other people. Ed. But you know what, Kevin? Let me tell you something. You know what I remember? I remember back in college when I, for the first time, hacked cable. Oh, yeah. I spliced that thing. College? And we had, <laughs> I did that in elementary yeah, school. I did it. Yeah, I did that too when I was at home, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to make it seem like I was super smart when I was a kid. But, uh, was, but anyway, but yeah, hacking cable because here's the thing: if you hacked cable and you was only paying for one line, yeah, and you had yeah. like twenty other dudes or people that was like you spliced that line and they were all using it, you were probably a hacker. Yeah, you know, and we don't think about <laughs> it like that. I mean, you're hacking a yeah. a process to really exploit something to your benefit. You know, you're you were a hacker, man. And and why why I bring that up is because it goes back to the fundamentals of what fit what Philip was expressing. The fundamentals of achieving something, having the desire, trying to figure something out when there's not an, a direct answer, and really driving hard for it. And that that piece of that recipe is what creates success in technology. Mm -hmm. And I always say, when I'm looking to hire someone, if you have the basis of understanding, you don't have to know how to do it all perfectly. If you just have the basis I, in the, and the desire and the will, I can teach you the rest. But if you don't have the desire and the will, or if you come in thinking that you already know it all and you don't have anything to learn, then I can't help you. Yeah. Yo, Philip mentioned Juno. Juno's a perfect example of that, you know. Yeah, she she came in yeah. with a passion, got into his class, wanted to learn. She had that drive, that ambition, and look at her now. I mean, she runs DC two one four. And what more do you need yeah. to say? Yeah, and she's part, and she's also a member of Cult yeah. of the Day. Yeah, Cal. that's yeah. even more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah, success. She's worked at a couple different consulting companies, so she got her start in consulting, and she works for Bishop Fox. Mm. Which is a Bishop pretty well known, Fox. interesting, uh, highly okay. skilled. I, testing, I didn't know that. I didn't firm. know that. We yep. actually have a. We're going to have a yes. guest on yep. next week from Bishop. Bishop. Or actually, our next guest is from Bishop Fox as well. I know I, who you're I talking know you about do. too. I know you do. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be fun. <laughs> I had them as a guest on my old podcast yeah, yeah. as well. It, it's going to be an awesome one. I can't wait. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. so we, we've gotten into Philip's story a little bit about how he got into technology and, you know, kind of where his passions are and kind of how, what got him to what he's doing today. But there's one little problem with this backstory is this backstory doesn't go back far enough. We talked about this in, in the episode, actually, when we were on your podcast, Philip, I have never heard the bear story. And I <laughs> didn't want to hear the bear story until we had you on our podcast. And tonight is the night. We even actually going to name this episode <laughs> around the bear story. So you got to tell us, man, um, what's the elephant in the room? There, there's a story about a bear. You, you I, I already knew you were a <laughs> professional wrestler. I knew that. I knew nothing about how the bear got into this mix. So help me out. Yeah. What happened? And we're not talking, okay. we're not talking about no little average amateur professional wrestler type thing here. We're talking about real <laughs> hardcore back in the day wrestler, man. This is, this is some good stuff. So tell us about this story. Yeah. Are the, the, if, so if you bear with me, I'll share the story. <laughs> he did it. He did it. So yeah. Hey. So actually, actually, Bad actually joke. get things. Love it. <laughs> to, to to get things correct is uh wrestling the olympic wrestling is wrestling or high school wrestling is wrestling the sports entertainment wrestling, wrestling. is wrestling oh, yeah yeah <laughs> yes, free birds von yeah. erics 1980s <laughs> yeah. hardcore wrestling yeah. right there brother if you so were actually, in texas i actually wrestled the the free birds i i, I saw that the i saw that birds. that's awesome yeah. man so so kind of kind of set the stage for why this bear wrestling thing happened was when I was wrestling professionally, my my main job was bouncing at a nightclub because I was lucky to wrestle once a week. Mm -hmm. And so my my main job was working as a bouncer. So this nightclub I worked at was in Denton, Texas. It was called the Yellow Rose. It was over near uh, Fort Worth Drive and still 35. There? A cry everyone knows that area. No, it was across from where that Whataburger used to be. Okay. So it's been, okay. it's been torn down for a while because for a while there was a Home Depot there. They had knocked it down, put a Home Depot in. Now Philip, they do some apartments. What year some was other this? There. This was like an eighty-seven. Uh, I was I was graduating high uh, school that year. Yeah, so around <laughs> around eighty-eight, around eighty-eight, I I was there at that nightclub. Okay. Right? Where, and so I'm like, what? shoot, man, if you were still working there, yeah, I could have. We probably I crossed paths. Been. I could have been because honestly, yeah, because. Uh, I was there for about 87 to 88 or so. Well, I can, t you and, know how yeah. I know yeah. for a fact that you <laughs> aren't there at the same time as Jason. C Cause what? you didn't have to throw his butt out on the, on the parking lot for being <laughs> too stupid and getting drunk or getting, getting in a bar fight. Uh, yeah. He was probably shooing me out of there because I was about to do something stupid. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> wouldn't that be crazy if we found out? <laughs> Yeah. That would be funny. Yeah. Yeah. I have, yeah. I've got interesting stories where I've ran into other folks that I knew someone I knew that was a bouncer at a nightclub and I didn't really click. I didn't remember who they were for a while. Then one day he came in wearing this, uh, the, one of the shirt staff shirts from the name of the nightclub. I thought, yeah, I remember that dude. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I guess to get back on track. So I was working as a bouncer. And so they used to have bands like Thursday through Friday. I mean, Thursday through Saturday, but Sundays were too slow. They bring in special events. They brought in like this, these male strippers, like Chippendale type thing. That's why they you bring were there, in these different. Oh yeah. I forgot. You were there as your <laughs> yeah, alter seeing ego. Those, seeing those guns. He was probably one of the, he was probably yeah, one well, of the dancers. There, you know, there's a the, whole story the, behind the Jason picture that's seen him from DEF CON. Carmelicious. <laughs> That's not what this story is about, Kevin. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. <laughs> so they decided to have this, bring in this wrestling bear as a special event. And since I was a pro wrestler and kind of a hometown guy, worked at the nightclub, they decided to use me to market that event. So they took my wrestling promo picture, put on the poster along with the picture of the bear. And so it was open to anyone to wrestle. So anyone could wrestle the bear, not just, just me. Uh, but it was kind of interesting because when people were lining up to wrestle this bear, I ended up going last, but everyone was getting taken down because this bear, some of the wrestling bears will stand up on their hind legs. That was the way they typically worked. But then it was easier for someone to knock them off balance and get them down. So they trained this bear where it was sitting. So they got this broad base, better yeah. center of gravity. And the bear would actually wrestle with you. It would, 
put its front legs on you. It would uh, take its front legs and gra- try to grab your leg and try to sweep your leg out from under you. Wow. And so he was taking these other guys down left and right. So when it came up to my time to wrestle the bear, I got into wrestling or lineman stance and kind of got down, leaned forward and got my, my legs back. So it would be harder to take me down. He could get a hold of my leg, but he wasn't able to take me down. But I actually ended up wrestling the bear twice that night. So it was a 750 pound black bear, or brown bear, whichever one is the, the biggest of the two. 750 pounds. But 750 oh my pounds. Gosh. Yeah. It was like trying to push a parked car. So, you know, some cars, wow. out, some of the smaller cars, like the old VWs, you could kind of push it a little bit, but you just really weren't because the parking brake was on or whatever. That's kind of what it felt like. It would just barely move, but you really can't do much with it. Huh. So the first time I got through there, I, I just had, I really wasn't doing much with him. And so I said, I wasn't going to wrestle him again. But what happened was whoever did the best against the bear won a t-shirt that said, I wrestled Samson the bear and lost. And also won a bar tab. Nice. So I won this bar tab and plus knowing working there and knowing the bartenders, it was a pretty, it was pretty unlimited bar tab. Wow. So after I wrestled the bear first time, I thought, man, it's impossible. I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do that again. So after the bar tab, the manager comes along and says, Hey, Phil, would you wrestle the bear again? So I said, sure. And so I know how, which time it was I wrestled the bear because the t-shirt that I won was yellow. So in that shirt picture I have, the shirt I'm wearing is yellow. So I know that was the second time I wrestled the bear. So the second time I wrestled him, he ended up biting my ring finger. So my ring finger was in his mouth. And so the trainer said, hold still, I'll get your finger out. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to wait for <laughs> you to pull my, get my finger out of his mouth. He might yeah. bite it off. So I pulled my finger out. And so uh, they ended up ending the the match there. But the next morning, uh, I woke up with, I'd hyperextended my foot. So I didn't even realize this happened because I was- All the adrenaline? Uh, had a lot of al- alcohol yeah. and adrenaline. And so the next day I went to step out of bed. It was hard to walk. So I had to go into the- had to go get my, my foot looked at and get a tetanus shot since I got bitten by the wow. bear. I, I mean, can you imagine wow. going to the hospital and tell yeah. them, yeah, I think I hyperextended my <laughs> my leg wrestling a bear. And everybody's like, oh, God, what's this guy on? <laughs> yeah, you walk in there like, who beat you up? They're like, yeah, I got in a fight with a bear. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> wow. So, okay, you said you got, you've got pictures of it and you've got, uh, do you have pictures yeah, of I've both got a picture. yep. times you wrestled the bear, or do you have just the second time? Just just the one okay. time. Just the one time. If I would have been smart, the bartender there took pictures, and he had like had him printed and asked me which one. He gave me one of the pictures. So I got what I thought was the better picture. But some of those pictures, to see how big that bear was, because at that time, I was at least 240, and that bear's head was wider than my back. Wow. wow. From one of the angles, you could see it. And so I really wished I would have asked him for the negatives or asked him to print more copies of it because it was, there were some other good pictures, but I'm glad I got that one. And it's, it's funny how that picture has helped my personal branding. Oh, that in the awesome. form of pro yeah. wrestling background has helped my branding more than anything else because I ran into a meta guy at uh, Dallas Hackers Association once. And so he knew I was a wrestle the bear. I remember my daughter and I ran into him at the movie theater in Louisville, Louisville, Texas. And we're coming out, and he saw us, and he says, hey, that's Phil. He wrestled a bear. He, he recognized you. Well, you're wow. a pretty recognizable guy anyway, yeah. much less seeing you out there wrestling a bear. <laughs> that's going to be like something that's going to imprint in your brain. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, and actually, and I had hair back then, too, a lot of it. You, you know what? <laughs> I was thinking when I when, when I saw the one picture of you standing there with a bear, and we'll we'll put this picture on the screen so that everybody sees what we're talking about here. I do remember you had you had a pretty wholesome lock of hair up there on top. What what happened, yeah. man? You just you stress from the IT job and pen testing or what? <laughs> <laughs> nah, actually, I'd I'd cut my hair shorter because once I got had to when I went to school for CAD and all that during that time, a lot of people weren't accepting yeah. long hair oh. in jobs. So I cut my hair to to better find jobs and really the the shaving my head thing is kind of a powerful thing. A popular style of powerlifting is shaved head, so that's really why I originally shaved it. I used to have a shaved head and goatee. Yeah, and yeah. End up getting rid of the goatee because it made me look older than what I, you know, look made me look my age, and yeah. I wanted to look younger. So, I shaved <laughs> well, and yeah. the locks <laughs> were a good look for the nineteen eighties wrestler too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to. At one time, I had I had streaks put in. I had blonde streaks. I've had it that's permed. Awesome. And, yeah, 
You have so you got a lot of good pictures <laughs> of you back in the wrestling days too. We're gonna have to put some of those up as well. You actually don't have too many of those actually, but yeah. We well, actually got some of my old wrestling matches on YouTube. That was some of the matches recorded. That, so. that was a fascinating story, and I have seen some of the, your YouTube videos of some of your matches. That that's an interesting thing, yeah, um, to watch, especially if you remember wrestling back in the day, wrestling, right? Wrestling, yeah. Uh, it's a so um, <laughs> so. Hey guys, I t- let's do this. Let's take a quick break. Let's come back and let's start diving deeper into some of the things that Philip has done and why that's important. Let's do that. In our first segment tonight, Philip spoke about penetration testing, or pen testing. Pen testing lands in the realm of ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is a valuable component of an organization's security posture, providing a proactive approach to identifying and fixing security problems before malicious attackers can exploit them. This practice is widely recognized and utilized across various sectors, including government, finance, healthcare, and technology, to protect sensitive data and maintain trust with users and stakeholders. Back from our break here, and uh, that w- we're, we're going to take a, a complete 180 from talking about wrestling and spandex and tights and bears <laughs> and the von Erics and freebirds i'm sorry wrestling <laughs> i mispronounced it again uh we were having some pretty pretty interesting conversations with philip on offline there in our break about some other uh after party uh, uh events that took place when he was wearing his wrestling gear and uh pretty good stuff pretty good stuff but <laughs> philip i want to get into I'll, let's get back into cybersecurity here so what I'd like to talk about is a really awesome accomplishment that uh, that you achieved last year. Uh, you had won the Sands Difference Maker Award. Uh, it goes without saying that it has a whole lot to do with the massive, massive amount of people that now follow you because of all the different contributions that you've given back to the cybersecurity field and industry as a whole. Uh, but you won this for... Uh, in the category of podcast and video live stream content. And I'd, I'd just like to talk about that a little bit and and let us know what it's like to have such a cool and prestigious award like that. <laughs> sure. Just kind of the, the Sands Difference Makers Awards have different categories. They have like mentor of the year. They even had like lifetime achievement and uh, Kevin Mitnick got it. And so Dave Kennedy oh, cool. accepted for Kevin Mitnick, which was really pretty cool. And there's two categories to each one of the awards. So like the, the award I won for podcast was the community award or on the trophy. It says people's choice. So it makes <laughs> me feel like the rock. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. People's champion, yeah. but, <laughs> but this was by community vote. So people you were nominated and then people voted for you. The other category was committee vote. There was a committee of, 11 or 12 people that Sands picked to judge that category. So uh, hats off and congrats to the Cyber Queens. They won the, yeah, yeah. the community award. Yeah. But yeah, so so I was really happy about winning the, the community award because community means so much to me. And I've, you know, do a lot of speaking and did a lot of workshops, free workshops and stuff over the years and really love the community and really involved into it, in it. So really flattered that, that I was able to win because this is by votes yeah. from the community. And, you know, and so also like Paul security weekly was also in the running for that award. And so I don't think my podcast is better than theirs. And it was an honor to be in that category with those guys. Cause that's like one of the very first cybersecurity podcasts. And the, one of the first ones that I ever saw and really highly respect those people for what they yeah, do. Yeah, That's one of the first ones I've ever listened to as well was security weekly. And, and yeah, you're right. Um, uh, kudos to the Cyber Queens as well. Um, we we kind of got to know them a little bit last year. We were going to go to their live podcast event uh, in during Hacker Summer Camp uh, during DEF CON last year. And Jason and I got pulled away somewhere. I don't even remember where we ended up, but we ended up <laughs> somewhere else, a different side of the strip and missed it. But um, sounds like they're really starting to to get going well as well. 
I know they had a few changes over there, but yeah, hats off to them as well. It, it, it's a very interesting and, and awesome yeah. accomplishment to win something like that, especially when it's people's choice. Yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty cool because the two other cyber queens have kind of gone off to do their own thing, so, so which is kind of nice. And you know, when you get into podcasting, you just kind of have to find your your thing, your niche. Uh, because for me, I started out on a podcast with Alyssa Miller and Chloe Mistagi called The Uncommon Journey. We did that for almost a year. And then just between the three of us trying to schedule and also schedule with guests yeah. got really difficult. And so it kind of slowed down to not really putting out podcasts. Then we were asked to do our own individual podcasts. So I started the Hacker Factory podcast. And this was where I really got to enjoy it because I really got to do what I wanted to do. Uh, it started out was going to be more focused on offensive security, but with a lot of things I do, like when I started the Pwn School Project, which eventually got rebranded as DEF CON 940, it was called the Pwn School Project because it's hacking related. But then as time gone on, we saw the need for all these other areas of cybersecurity. And so that's kind of when I started the new podcast. I really didn't want it where it was just sounds like it was just going to be offensive security. That's why I just went with the Philip Wiley show. Because then it could be, it doesn't even have to be cybersecurity. I had someone on that is a, uh, was a meditation practitioner. It was a personal trainer and he had some life changing events and was just kind of a toxic person. But this near death experience helped him turn his, his life around, become a better person and was able to accomplish this through meditation and share with others meditation. And, you know, mental health is an important thing in cybersecurity because they're putting long hours. Sometimes yeah. it can be a stressful job. So bringing in someone to talk about something not directly associated with the role itself, but ways that you could deal with, you know, mental health through meditation. And so, you know, I may have other folks on there too from time to time that may not have anything to do directly with uh, cybersecurity. Just like one of the things I love talking about is content creation. And one of the things I really loved about me and you guys, because it's nice to have friends and colleagues that do more than just the same thing. Cause a lot of my friends, all we talk about is cybersecurity, but it's kind of nice when I get with a couple of folks like you and we can talk about what mics yeah. you're using, what yeah. camera you're using, yeah. what are you doing to edit and talk about that stuff and geek out on something different because, you know, we can kind of get away from the day to day, the day job type stuff and, and enjoy something else. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so just I remember hearing about that Sands Award and seeing the pictures and all this. And I told Kevin, I'm like, you know, that's just a great, another great accomplishment to be acknowledged by the the uh, community for for the work that you've done. And um, and so I'm proud of you. I mean, you did a great job. I'm glad it was you. I'm glad you got that award. It, it just works. It goes well with you. Um but, you know, we haven't gotten into the root of, you know, what you really are. And that ends being a hacker. <laughs> and so let's shift gears a little bit and let's get into that a little bit. I know you founded the HackerMaker.com where you teach others how to get started with a career in white hat hacking. You know, so I thought maybe you can share a little bit more for our listeners that might be interested in what does it take to be a pen tester or, you know, or to do hacking and maybe make a living doing that? You shared a little bit about the challenges of being in this world as a as a hacker or cybersecurity professional um, that you have to balance some things. And maybe sometimes mental health weighs you down because you have long hours and it can be hugely stressful. So what are some of the other aspects about it that can really gravitate someone to want to do this job? So if you're, if you really have a strong curiosity and you like things like puzzles and some people that are into video games do well with, with, uh, hacking with pen testing. So that's kind of some things to look at, because one of the things that's interesting when I was a kid, my dad used to take my mechanical and electronic toys apart to see how they work. And so I kind of picked up on that from him. And so that's kind of really got, got my curiosity and interest in the interest in hacking because I would take things apart. It kind of reminds me one time, uh, my mom and my aunt and my little brother, we were fishing. My brother was just a baby and we were up in there. My aunt had this taxi and I was goofing around with it and unplugged all the wires from the dash and it wouldn't start. And so 
I went back and was able to put them all back together and get it to work. So I've always liked figuring out how things work. Uh, and even going back to just the hacker mindset, the curiosity and wanting to hack into things back in my AutoCAD days. One time I tried, I saw like a drawing file. And so like they had a lock file to prevent you from opening up those AutoCAD drawing files. And I deleted the lock file and I was able to open a drawing while someone else, oh, someone wow. else was <laughs> in it. So I've always had that curiosity of, of that, trying to make things work differently, trying to do, you know, cause you know, the, really the heart of it's a real hacker mindset or the true definition of hacker was, you know, developers, builders, makers, people creating stuff. It wasn't really hacking into things, but the media kind of used that on towards cyber criminals instead of, they came up with the term hacker and that's why it kind of stuck and has kind of a negative connotation, but people that are curious and like to see how things work, uh, you know, if you, you need to be curious and just have a passion for learning because it takes it takes a lot to learn. It's one of the most difficult things I've had to learn. But then again, you take other people and they pick it up fairly easy. It just depends. But yeah, it's a an interesting field. But one of the things I do want to say too is that I like to share because there's so many other cool places that you can go in cybersecurity that you don't have to be a penetration tester or a hacker. There's a lot of other cool roles. And I like to share that because so many people coming into the field only know of hacking or whatever. They don't really know if people are running firewalls, people doing threat intelligence, people doing uh, GRC and those other roles. So just one thing I'd advise people is try it all out and see what works out for you. Because I had a, a former coworker at U.S. Bank that he was an IT and he was taking all these SANS courses for digital forensics. He was going to be a digital forensic analyst. So he's going through all these SANS courses. I think he's working on a master's degree or whatever. And uh, he decided that he was going to take the SANS G-Pen course, the pen testing course, to help him be better, better at digital forensics. He took that course, fell in love with pen testing, and that's the route he went. So now he's been pen testing for about seven, maybe going on eight years now. And I did an episode of him on my old podcast, The Hacker Factory. The title was called The Accidental Pen Tester because he just kind of tried something different and found out that's what his passion was. And so you really need to try all the different things because if you don't, you may totally miss out on what your, you know, your true passion is or what you're yeah, really good at. that's very, very true. And cybersecurity is definitely a, a world where you can go in so many different directions. And you see a lot of times when you get to talking to people that at, at the meetups or at the uh, conferences or at the many, many places where you can go and, and network with people in this field. Um, they they come from all walks of life, don't they? I mean, they come from all over the place. And, uh, and yes. it's interesting, Jason and I say this a lot, is like you just said, try a lot of things because you never know where you're going to end up. When I first got into IT, I had no idea what I was really going to do. I just knew I was chasing a few certs and it was of interest to me. And at the time, I couldn't even spell cybersecurity. So... <laughs> I, I'm surprised I ended up here, but this is where I am. Spell it now, <laughs> Kevin. Spell it now. That's the right yeah. time. <laughs> We're not going to get into the old spelling bee, man. <laughs> so, so, you know, you guys are talking about this. It, a funny story came to mind. I Talking about, you know, again, going back to being curious and, you know, really exploring what the possibilities might be. You know, many, many, many years ago, my wife and I have older, some older kids. And when those kids were younger and uh, adolescents, um, I had uh, built a, uh, a terminal viewer software that I had uh, employed on one of our computers at the time. And um, I, I, I showed my wife, I said, watch this. We would go upstairs at night and on the weekends and we, our late night entertainment was I'd hack into that machine and I would watch their screen to see what they were doing. <laughs> so I could, so I could determine if they were doing what they should be doing or not. And sometimes I caught them doing things they shouldn't be doing and I would screen capture it <laughs> and then we'd have a conversation and they'd be like, how are you doing that? <laughs> Dude, I'm like, don't mess on my network. If you're on my network, I'm going to catch you. So don't do it. Right? So I had the fear put through all of my kids that they knew if they screwed up and did anything on my network, I was going to catch them. 
but it was that <laughs> why I did it was more so because I was curious around how the technology worked and what I could do with the technology. And as a byproduct of that, I had a I had a use case to use it in, right? You know, and yeah. and it was fun <laughs> and we enjoyed doing it. So <laughs> so you just never know. That's funny. Right? You never know what it'll lead you. That's but. funny. You reminded me of when when we used to sneak that moto safety gadget in my daughter's ODB two port in her little Yaris. She had <laughs> oh, no yeah. idea we knew where she was at all times. And we'd be like, So that's so, so what you're saying is you're going to hang out with your brother and sister. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And you're going to be there how long? Okay. And you'll be back home when? <laughs> yeah. Great. And we would just monitor this little app, man, and just, man, we busted her so many times. And we didn't tell her for probably until about 10 years later what we were actually doing and how we always knew where she was. That app was cool, though, man. You could set That's up funny. little geofencing <laughs> yeah. on it, and you could tell it when, when she enters this geofence, send me a text. And when she leaves that geofence, send me a text. So we knew if she was on time to work, on time to school, if she was really at her house or if she was at her boyfriend's, we knew everything back then. It was awesome. It was awesome. You know what would be a good episode? <laughs> it would be child stories of uh, children of hackers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> that would be a that would be a good uh, okay. episode, man. All so, of the yeah. crazy things. So, so hackers out there that are listening to this episode, hit us up. We're looking for good stories. We'll bring you on. We'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool, Philip. I, I I like to to hear the story about that and and kind of how how your paths have have led you to where you are today. And I know when you started Hacker Maker, you um, ended up turning that into the DC 940. And I think it's huge that um, you also can add that to your list of accolades to say, not only hacker, not only pen tester, not only author, not only overall general cybersecurity badass and wrestler, Philip Wiley also started <laughs> and founded the DC 940 meetup group for DEF CON. So that's awesome. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the 940 area code that's up in Denton, Texas, which is a suburb of the DFW Metroplex, or as we call it here, the DFW, which is a huge metropolitan area, <laughs> and it's exploding. I, I would say between Dallas-Fort Worth and the Arlington area and everything that's just exploding up north of Dallas, you got McKinney, Plano, Frisco, Allen, Melissa, uh, all of that up in that area is just it going bonkers. And I think a lot of it is because the, the job scene up here is out of control, uh, especially tech jobs. So I can see the meetups here in the DFW Metroplex really growing uh, over the next several years. So that's awesome. And uh, I guess really where I want to go with this, though, is, you know, you did this even with all the other stuff we've talked about that you have on your plate which is a lot on aside from your day job. So where does one find the time and the mental capacity to say, you know what? I think I'm just going to start a DC meetup group and found that and get it off the ground and do everything that's involved in that. What, what took you there? Yeah, really what kind of inspired it was teaching when I was teaching at Dallas college uh, cause the first group I ran was the Pwn school project. So, um, I started that because I had a couple, couple potential students that came to Dallas hackers association. They weren't wanting to take my pen testing course, but what they couldn't get transferred or get get registered for some weird reason. And I kind of had been thinking about starting an educational group that anyone could attend and make it more education focused. So I started the Pwn school project. So I started meeting running a meeting here in, in Dallas and then one in Denton. And so when the pandemic hit, I went virtual, just one meeting per month virtually. And then once things started back in person, I started up the group in Denton back up because Denton really needed the community because there was really, that was the only cybersecurity community in Denton. And so that Texas. was after the pandemic? And, you know, it's a fairly decent sized town. Okay. Yeah. So it was after the pandemic, once things got to where you could go back in person, so I rebranded uh, 
the the Pwn School project in Denton to DC nine forty. I guess it was like October of two thousand twenty one, and so the first month it was rebranded. We like doubled the attendance, and what happened there is more people are going to know about a DEFCON group than they sure. would the Pwn School project. And another reason I rebranded it too is I figured it, one day I'm going to want to step away from it, and at the same time too I thought. I don't want to turn over a Pwn School group because like my my co-hosts that helped me out there, uh Papa Shell and Funky Cole, Rick and, and uh Sheldon, they would have been okay, but I was thinking, what happens the people that take it over from them? If they do something wrong, then that could come back on me. I didn't want anything tarnishing something I came up with. So I knew if I started DEFCON group. If whoever ever at some point went running it was doing things wrong, they would have the the local DEF CON group uh, committee yeah, they'd have to deal to with. To they it. would that shut it down sense. or whatever. And so that was yeah. easier. So the overall just rebranding just brought more visibility to it and it sounded less of like a newbie type meetup. And so it's really kind of helped out that we've rebranded. Like I said, it's easier to, easier to find. You get listed on the local DEF CON group website. So maybe someone relocates to the Dallas Fort Worth area or Denton and they can look through there, wherever they're at, you can look through there, find DEF CON groups in your area because they're all over the world. So it makes it easier to find that way. And so that's kind of where that went. And so juggling all this is kind of was interesting because at that time I was teaching at the college, had a day job, but this was before I was podcasting or any of that. So just basically using my spare time to do all this because before uh, I watched a lot of movies because before I started teaching, I used to watch over a hundred movies a year oh my in gosh. movie theaters. Wow. And so I remember after two months into the Pwn School project meeting, I sat there and was thinking, yeah, I've, I've seen all these movies over the years, a hundred movies per year, but I thought I'm not going to be able to do that anymore because of, uh, you know, the time I don't have as much time. But the thing was, I was a lot happier because I was helping other people. And, and so did you have one of those movie subscriptions where you had so many, like a, a block of movies that you could go see within a month? No. Oh, wow. You did it the hard way. Yeah. (laughs) The only thing I've got going is that I have like a subscription to uh Cinemark. You sign up and you get like one movie per month. Oh, and really, Really, the main benefit for that is you can you can buy uh, you can get tickets online and it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. So that's kind of the the benefit of doing that. Yeah. Right before the There's pandemic, no there was fees. a big push around doing these packages that you can get subscription and you could see so many movies a month and uh, you you had already paid for it. It's just an ongoing monthly subscription. It's a great idea because movies are trying to get that reoccurring yeah. revenue that they could that they could lock in over a course of a year. But then the pandemic hit and like nobody was going to a movie theater and they were renting everything uh, online or watching it in ne- on Netflix. And that whole program just kind of went to crap. Yeah. That sucks. I, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I remember how I had a good buddy of mine that, that had that and they turned around and you could see any movie. Then they limited to yeah. after the movie had been out so long, you couldn't see first run movies. Yeah. And then it went to, a movie per week and not one a day. I, yeah, I just remember it just yeah, and it went just, kaput, especially yeah. when the pandemic hit. But yeah. yeah, it sucks. But but as many movies as you were seeing, though, Philip, when you were in your heyday, let's call it your movie watching heyday, yeah. did they not recognize you the second you walk in and say, okay, this dude's here all the time. Give him a large popcorn on the house. Did you at least not have popcorn? I really never ran into that. Yeah, I don't, I never got recognized for that. I don't know. There's so many. You know, it's a part-time job, and I really don't even really remember seeing a lot of the same people. No VIP popcorn. Multiple times there. Man, that's, you were just getting robbed. You think, (laughs) you think they would have been there. That's the bear rattling guy, right? You know what, Jason? (laughs) He didn't wear his shirt in there. I bet if he had worn the shirt. Or his tights. I bet the tights would would have done it. it. Hell, I'd have given him two buckets of popcorn. It's actually funny, back in those days... Back in those days, I would see as high as three movies in wow, one day. That's crazy, man. Ooh, man. I guess you did have yeah. a, a lot more spare yeah. time on, on your hands back then, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. hey, you know, it, it, there's a lot of people that are that hoard, hardcore about seeing um, movies right when they come out. And so 
it, it's a fun hobby. It just does consume a lot of time. If you have anything like podcasting or anything like that, that is your movie time right there. Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. Yep, I stay pretty pretty busy with that. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's take a break here and let's come back and let's talk about a little bit more about the Cyber Circus Network and start wrapping this this episode up. I think there's still a lot of good conversation to have around that. And uh, so let's take a break and come All righty. Are you new to hacking? If so, DEF CON meetup groups are a great place to get started in your hacker journey. DEF CON meetup groups typically involve community building, knowledge sharing, skill development, and networking. DC groups or DEF CON groups provide excellent networking opportunities with peers and experts in the cybersecurity and hacking fields. And we're back and we're on the final segment of this episode. We've already had a lot of fun having a conversation with our good friend, Philip Wiley. Now what we want to do is get into the extra special stuff that we're launching this year. If you haven't heard, we've gone together and we've created something new called the Cyber Circus Network. And this is a collaboration of the Philip Wiley Show, the Cyber Distortion Podcast, and uh, Barcode Security uh, podcast show all coming together uh, to do live events. We have several of them already lined up. And and really, this was a byproduct of our uh, Dallas live event that we did back in December and had so much fun doing that and brought in a a really good crowd. It was uh, one of those events where there was a lot of collaboration, high profile individuals as guests that went very well. And, and we all just had a really good time doing it. So we decided that we wanted to do more of this stuff, really, really grow the network and and encourage people to become a part of the Cyber Circus Network and grow the opportunities that we all have to continue to get this message out uh, around cybersecurity in a number of different ways. So, Kevin, Philip, let's tell people about the network and, and what they can look forward to in this next year. Sure. Philip, uh, I'll let you start and I'll close. How's that? Okay. All right. Sure. That works. Yeah, it's pretty exciting because, man, we had a, a blast in Grapevine. I figured it was going to be fun, but had no idea what it was going to be like until we actually did it. And then doing that one time and then we talks of doing it more, I'm pretty excited about The live stuff is, was a lot of fun. And it's fun to collaborate with others. One of the things I had intent on doing because I learned from, you know, some expert podcasters and other content creators, one of the better ways to build your podcast is to collaborate with others because their uh, listener base gets to hear you. And so they, you know, you could possibly pick up more listeners that way. And it's just fun to collaborate with others. And, you know, when you do your same thing all the time, it can be fun and enjoyable. But when you group up, you know, team up with some other podcasters, then it's even more fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, I mean, fun, fun is, man, that's an understatement. Even I, I had, dude it was so much it was so cool first off jason and i have never done anything live so i know you guys you you and chris shout out to chris glandon over at barcode chris does this stuff live all the time and uh you know and i kind of teased it earlier we saw him in las vegas barcode at barcode and that's what got jason and i's juices flowing to try to do something like this and 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 we got to know chris through that cool dude fun to collaborate with and we realized we okay we got similar interests with Philip we got similar interests with Chris. Chris reached out to me kind of out of the blue right before Thanksgiving, and I remember he he came out and said, "Hey, uh, I'm going to be down in Dallas. If I do a show, can you make it out?" I'm like, "Yeah, of course I can make it out, man. You know I'll be there." Uh, he, he asked me what I was doing that week of the seventh, and I said, "Well, when are you going to be here? I'll be there." And he said, "No, I don't want you there. I, I, I want I want you to be on the mic with me." I'm like. Oh, cool. I'm going to get to go live. All right. Awesome. Jason and I already <laughs> talked about this. So I knew I was going to call Jason and I did. And he was all excited, but he didn't, he didn't, you didn't lead on like you were that excited when I first told you, cause you probably weren't sure if you were going to come yet. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm thinking these guys are going to have so much fun without me, man. And yeah. <laughs> I, I got to figure out how to make this work before, before I, I commit some excitement to it. And so yeah. <laughs> you told me this, I hung up and I'm like, that's all I could think about, man. I'm like, you guys, yeah. you're going to pull this off and I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to be a part of this because I can't let you have all this fun without. 
So I started finagling some <laughs> things and I think we talked the next day. And yeah, yeah. And you said, So what do you think? You think you'll be able to make it? I'm like, dude, I already booked my ticket. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still not making me. it. <laughs> yeah, you caught me off guard with that one because I was like Thanks. I had one foot out the door when I when I called you because we were heading out of town to go to my wife's family uh, and and over Thanksgiving. And I just told Jason, I said, just think about it. Just think about it. You don't have to tell me now. We'll talk after the holidays. And I think you had either texted me or called me the next day. We were at, we were there. And I said, really, dude, you already booked, you already booked your flight. Okay. Awesome. This thing's on, man. I'm texting Chris. I'm texting Philip. I'm like, guys, we got to, we got to get a lineup together. And we did a good lineup. We had, um, the, uh, several members from the DFW hacker community. We had Wirefall there from Dallas Hackers Association. We had uh, Juno from DC214 and Neural Phantom from over at Hackful Worth. And then we talked AI as the second segment of the live podcast. We talked AI with uh, Quentin Rhodes, Herrera, and Hutch, both very good uh, uh, experts on that topic. So like you said, all-star lineup. And then to top it all off, the thing that was the is it pièce de résistance? Is that how they say it in France? The the icing on the <laughs> cake was that we were able to land two sponsors to help us make this event even cooler. One yeah. Chris landed from up in in his area up up near Philly. The Cyberstrike guys, he was really cool too, man. Really cool dude. Enjoyed getting to know him and getting hang out with him. He paid for the open bar for three hours. And so everybody there got, got to have the open bar for three hours. And then we got Trace 3 to come in and help us. And, and they came in and sponsored all the raffle prizes. Hutch came in and gave away his, his signed his book. I think he yeah. gave away about 20 signed copies of his book because he had literally just hot off the presses, pulled it <laughs> off Amazon and got it like that week. <laughs> yeah. So, man, it just, everything kind of just, there was only one piece of it that did not work in our favor. You guys know what I'm going to say, right? The Grapevine Light Festival. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's we been a thorn in your it. side since since we did this. You've been complaining about that ever <laughs> since. Dude, dude that, that's the only thing that annoyed me about it because, you know, I remember I was I was talking to some of the people, all right, here's how you get there, you know, but be careful. My wife sends me a text that morning and she says, hey, did you know about this? She sends me a screenshot. And the screenshot on the image showed the route of the parade of lights, which is basically a, a <laughs> series of floats with Christmas lights on them. And she said, is that anywhere near where you're going tonight? And I'm like, I'll be damned if it's not right next to where we're going tonight. So I texted Chris <laughs> right away and I said, dude, I don't know if you know about this or not, but we might want to let everybody that's here. That's, that's been invited to this thing, know about it, everybody that's registered. And so, yeah, that kind of scared us that we might not have much of a turnout at all. But it it turned out being a really good turnout. It was fun. Yeah. And and the, the the cool thing at the end was just being able to give raffle items out to everybody that showed up to kind of help pay them back for showing up and, and making it out there for the event. So if that didn't describe for all of you how much fun this event was in December and what you could look forward to multiple times over this 2024 year. Let us tell you a little bit about some of the events that we are going to be doing this live collaboration show at. And, and it's going to be uniquely different at each event that we do it at. But you will be guaranteed to be entertained in a way you haven't been before around topics in cybersecurity and technology. That is guaranteed. So, Kevin, why don't you share a little bit about what our lineup looks like? So, right now... We have seven events, six events, I'm sorry, six events lined up for 2024 that would be live podcast type events. Uh, the very first one coming up in April, April 28th, it's part of the MES, which is the Mid Midsize Enterprise Summit, which is a cybersecurity conference for midsize businesses. That one is in Orlando. Uh, that one is already booked, so that one is definitely in the books we had another one that we were working on at RSA. We're still kind of hopeful, but we're not 100% sure. That one would be uh, a vendor-sponsored event at RSA. It would be live. If we don't make it happen this year, we're definitely going to try to make it happen by next year. Do like a speakeasy-type atmosphere. 
um, and and do something live there. Uh, On that we, note, you vendors out there, if you're looking at doing something unique at RSA and want to collaborate, um, we're still looking to book that event. And uh, so, yeah, hit us up. Yeah. So that one, that one was in the works. Um, and if any of them fall apart, it'll be that one. But these other ones are pretty much locked in. The next one is the Boardwalk Bites event, which is July 12th. That one's up in Atlantic City, New Jersey at the Bally's, I believe. Right, guys? Yeah. And that's the first, yes. first ever inaug- yes. inaugural event for Bar- Boardwalk Bites. So a uh, great location, a uh, great venue. Going to have a really good lineup there. Uh, it's, a, it's a short um, conference, so it's only a couple of days. Uh, which is also great, and it lines up with the weekend. So come on out and see us at Boardwalk Bites and uh, enjoy the conference, and then stay for the weekend. Enjoy the weekend. Yeah, and be sure to network with us and and hang out and have a beer with us. We'll we'll have fun talking. Um, the next one is actually during Hacker Summer Camp. That's the one we've got set up for the Cyber Circus Sin City. And so this is going to be similar to what we did, Lone Star Cyber Circus in Grapevine that we just described. This one would have its own twists and turns, uh, most likely be a sponsored event. So there could be some really cool raffles and really could get cool giveaway stuff. So uh, stay tuned for that one. Um, the exact venue has not been de- decided on, but the dates will be somewhere in around the middle of the week-ish around other events. And then another fall MES event this time in Tampa, this one is going to be uh, September 15th. That's the same group that's doing the April event. And then the last one, of course, we could not not have another Lone Star Cyber Circus again in December. I've looked at the dates. I have not tried to correlate this date with the Festival of Lights, but I will go back and do that. And if it's on this week, I'll move it up a week. But right now I've got it scheduled yeah. for uh, December 12th. And that would be the Lone Star Cyber Circus 2. I would imagine same venue because the venue was really cool. Hoppenstein Brewery in, in downtown Grapevine. So those are the ones right now. We expect this list to probably grow next year if this goes off as we expect it will. So keep an eye out. Uh, we got our site up, cybercircusnetwork.com. We store all this stuff out there. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is just a great way to network, um, learn learn some interesting things, latest technology trends, uh, tactics in cybersecurity, uh, get entertained while you're doing it, maybe win a few prizes and have a good time. So uh, we hope you can join us for one of these events this year and maybe look forward to either sponsoring an event or uh, attending one of our events for next year. So. Any last words, Kevin and Philip, before we move to the the final part of this episode? Nope. No, we we we've fully covered Cyber Circus. Just be there; it's so much fun. We enjoy hanging out with people and networking. We all—that's how we grow. Networking yeah. is how we grow. And just if you can make it, that'd be awesome. We'd love to meet everybody out there. Absolutely. Now let's have uh, some fun. All right, so. To finish <laughs> this episode off, we'd like to sometimes do with our guests a little game. And uh, so this is going to be our quick hit questions. And so, Philip, we're just going to ask you, I'll do five, Kevin will do five, I'll do five, Kevin will do five. And we're going to ask you a series of questions. And your objective is just to give us the first answer off the top of your head. And, these are insane too. And, and um, we're some just, of these are insane. <laughs> yeah. We're just gonna roll with it as quickly as we can all the way down through through to the end. And I mean, okay. try not to laugh, but some of these you won't you just will not be able to avoid that. So all right, you guys ready? I'm ready. Let's do yeah, it. Here we go. Okay, I'm going first. All right. So Philip, would you rather have a permanent clown nose or clown shoes? Clown shoes. Fight one horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses. One horse-sized duck, because I'm a bear wrestler, so I have to go big or go home. <laughs> <laughs> Use eye drops made of vinegar or toilet paper made of sandpaper. 
toilet paper made a sandwich. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, Ralph. That's painful. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Always smell like garlic or like fish. <laughs> garlic. <laughs> Have fingers for toes or toes for fingers. Midnight fingers for toes. <laughs> That'd be kind of good because you you can kind of hang upside down from trees. And stuff. Oh, yeah, right. can, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. There you go. That'd be fun. Can muck, muck you around. Okay, Kevin, your turn. Yeah. All right, I got I got my first first five coming at you here. Be covered in fur <laughs> or covered in scales. Covered in scales, Aquaman. I like it. <laughs> I told you these are ridiculous. Right. Have your only mode of transportation be a donkey or a giraffe? A giraffe. How cool would it be to go to freaking Vegas on a giraffe for DEF CON? It's nice because if you're in traffic, you can climb up its neck and see what's going on. Ooh, oh, yeah, dude, there you yeah, go. I didn't think about that. I didn't think <laughs> about that. that. That's a great idea. Okay. Be able to only use a fork with no spoons or only use a spoon with no forks. Uh, use a fork with no spoons. Fork with no spoons. See, I'd go opposite there. I'd probably go spoon with no fork. No, Just in man, case you had something too bad slimy. You yeah. You know, yeah. mashed potatoes. Is too bad. I guess mashed too potatoes. Bad spork, you can do. spork wasn't an option. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Well, you kind of have to improvise. <laughs> Maybe take your, your file out and make your own little <laughs> points. Okay. Have a constantly leaking nose or constantly sweaty hands. <laughs> this is a gross constantly one. Constantly sweating hands. <laughs> yeah. It, no, I don't know. You shake a lot of hands, though, man. You do it a lot. It's of easier to shaking. hide. You can wipe your hands off, but nose is kind of. You don't want to constantly be off, have on wet. the stage doing yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Only. Oh, this kind of goes with your wrestling garb. Ah, this would be interesting when you're out. Only be able to wear neon orange or neon green for the rest of your life. Mm, I like both those colors. I guess I'll go in neon green because I've kind of got I've got a neon green car. Oh, do you okay. really? All right, cool. <laughs> metallic neon, neon green. green. Interesting. All right, all Jason, right. back to you. That's all right. Have a permanent unibrow or n- no eyebrows at all? God, dude, <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, no eyebrows at all. <laughs> <laughs> Fight a kangaroo or an orangutan in a boxing match. Man, that would be tough. Yeah. How does I would that say stack probably up to a kangaroo, the bear? Kangaroo. Uh, oh. Because like, orangutan can rip your arms off. I mean, a kangaroo can mess you up pretty bad, but orangutans, those things are just stupid strong. Yeah, and the, the arm length, right? You know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You couldn't even get in on them. All right. Yeah. Have the ability to read minds or be invisible. Hmm. I guess read minds. Me too. Me too. That'd be cool. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, because just the whole thing of being invisible would be really a pain. Some people think it's cool. Yeah, but it's just no one would see you. It'd make things so awkward. You read minds. You don't read minds. You really don't. People don't have to know that you can read minds. So you can. Yeah, you can hide hide your handicap or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah. All right, time travel <laughs> to the past or to the future. Time travel to the past. Yeah. Okay. I don't, the future future may be too scary. That's true. I may not That's true. There. That's true. Be a tiny <laughs> elephant or a giant hamster. <laughs> giant hamster. That's <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Giant's always better. All right, Kevin, your last. Yeah, five. Is it my turn? Okay. Yep. Okay. Last five. <laughs> How, would you rather have the legs of a frog or the head of a fly? Legs of a frog. <laughs> of course who wouldn't yeah, I mean, yeah. that'd be easier easier to hide maybe maybe take those toes from the monkey earlier or the finger toes yeah. <laughs> could you be pretty pretty powerful all right only be able to shout the word yes or only be able to whisper the word no every time uh, you say no you whisper. have to say no yeah whisper the <laughs> whisper no yeah, shouting the word yes would get pretty <laughs> annoying pretty quick, wouldn't it? Yeah, because you're yes, yes. People are going to think you're having too good of a time there or something. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, because yeah, then, then you'd have to start changing the way you say yes and make it sound like you're yeah. not really having fun when you're saying yes. <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> only be able to watch the first episode of any TV series or only be able to watch the last episode. 
I guess the first episode. Mm. Yeah, because you kind of would have to make sense of a lot of things if you only watch the yeah. last one, right? All right. Yeah. Have the hiccups for the rest of your life or always feel like you need to sneeze, but you can't. Oh, man. I guess always feel like you got to sneeze because hiccups are, yeah. That's, that's, that's a rough <laughs> one, man. I'd constantly want, yeah. want to be looking up at the sun so I can get it out. All right. <laughs> last one. Always have to enter rooms by announcing your name or always have to do a cartwheel to get out. Uh, announce my name because I can't do cartwheels. <laughs> I, can't, I can't either, man. I'd break my hip trying to do a cartwheel. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. That those those were actually those were some colorful ones there. Oh yeah, we don't they normally were, get yeah. the good, they get them that good. That was good. <laughs> so Kevin, why don't you tease up the next episode for our guests so they know what yeah, to look so for next? Closing this one down, Philip. Again, thank you for being on with us, everybody. Please go out to Philip's. Uh, Philip's website and his uh, his Twitter page and his YouTube channel and his Spotify and subscribe. Uh, Philip's got some awesome guests on all the time and uh, he's just a damn good dude. So help him out, subscribe to his channel and uh, tell a friend. Um, okay, moving into episode three, which we will be recording here in the next couple of weeks. We have a very special guest. You, if you haven't heard of her, you may know of her. Her name is Elise Dennis, and she is a former social engineering black badge winner at DEF CON. I believe it was DEF CON in 2019. She won. And if you don't know how they win that, she's going to talk all about it. But um, it's an, it's a fascinating thing to watch. I remember the very first time I went to DEF CON and sat in the social engineering village, I couldn't get up. I didn't want to get up and lose my seat. Standing room only out the door into the hall. If you left to go to the bathroom, somebody was getting your seat. And I got in second in row, first row, got to watch it for four hours straight. It's awesome, awesome stuff to watch. But she's going to talk all about that. And we've been looking forward to having her on for a long time. So we're going to get to hear all about the experience of doing that, all about fishing, and all about what it's like to be the uber black badge winner that she is. So Absolutely. really looking forward to it. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. So again, Philip, thank you for being on the show. It's always fun to talk shop with you and you know share with people your success and how you got there and you know, and, and the things to come. So it was a exciting time and Kevin and I enjoyed our, we always enjoy our time with you. Um, with that, we're going to be signing off, but wait, hold on a second. What? Oh, sorry, dudes. Hold on a second. Hack Nasty wants to say something. Hack Nasty. Hack Nasty. Okay, he was like, I can't wait to see what this is. I'm like, dude, I got to show. Okay. All right, dude. We, okay. You better oh. join the Cyber Distortion Podcast. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Get on it. Don't be a fool. All right, Hack Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, get him under control, please. I'm, I had to put him away, man. I told him, knock it off. That's his only time he's going to be in the talk. Oh, so, all right. We'll see. <laughs> all right. With that, we're going to sign off with you guys and stay safe. Till next time. Take care, everybody. I'm Ashley. I'm an artificially generated avatar with the ability to manipulate your mind via the power of my intelligence botnets. Let me prove it to you. You're about to click on that subscribe button and then you'll click on the notification bell so you don't miss when Kevin and Jason drop future episodes of the Cyber Distortion Podcast. So, go ahead. That's right. Slide your mouse over slowly and gracefully, there you go. Now click. See, that wasn't so bad now was it? I'd like to thank you for listening to today's amazing podcast episode on YouTube or your favorite audio streaming platform, and don't forget to tell your friends. Oh, and remain diligent my cyber friends. The world is a very scary place.